What is this? A million tissues? No. It's a chocolate caramel. And baby wipes? Where did these come from? What? I'm allergic to baby wipes. What? Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill. Another D&D video already. Oh, <gasps> la gasp. I have revised my familiar rules. Revised? No, that's not the right word. Let's back up. A while ago, quite a while now, many of you came here from this video, uh, I did a video talking about how I approach animal companions and, uh, you know, familiars and the like. My stupid rules for earning an animal companion. Lately I've, I've gone back and I've looked at specifically the familiars section of that video and I've just, you know, um, I've removed a little bit of the stupid. The familiar section was never particularly stupid, but the little bit of stupid that was there, I've sucked it out. I hope. What am I talking about? What am I saying? Vague and evocative. I want a character's familiars to feel earned. I want a character to feel very attached to their animal familiar. And I want it to um, break the character's heart just a little bit when or if that familiar dies. Here's how I approach doing that mechanically. So, let us begin. So now, here's how I um, flavor-wise set this up. You don't have to have the exact same flavor in the background, but this is how I think about it. I wanted familiars in my setting to be almost like um, like the magic user, specifically a wizard if we're talking 5th edition. I know warlocks can get familiars, rules as written. We'll get to that later. I wanted the idea to be that a wizard is drawing on their soul, not necessarily their soul, their essence, their, you know, their own magic, their, their self, their spirit-y thing. And I wanted to give the impression that they're pulling out this, this aspect of themselves, they're pulling it into the world as they experience it in a way that makes it both vulnerable and more powerful so they can access a little bit of their magic even more strongly right and as i was thinking about this i thought this this is just this is just fun flavor text from my from my game this is just a bit of added stuff so for me the idea is that because this is a piece of yourself and you're bringing it into the sort of material plane it has to take a shape it has to take a physical form but it's you and it can't take on your form your form's already taken so instead you guide the familiar spirit to take on the shape of an animal that reflects who you are right i think i talked about this last time so it's a, a little bit of horcrux a little bit of patronus a little bit of daemon i haven't read his dark materials but all y'all keep telling me this is this is like that. I did like the trailer with Lin Manuel Miranda and his rabbit. So, how do we back up this concept mechanically? I do it in four steps. First step, the ritual. Prep the ritual. Second step, personalized trials. Third step, what form will the familiar take? Fourth step, statting up a familiar. So, let's talk this through. The ritual. I want to make the player work for it a little bit, you know? But I want it to be fun work for it, not, you know, a drag work for it. I suggest that the character will need to find or um, set up a ritual summoning circle, because that sounds magic, doesn't it? We all remember my Stargate circle, right? There you go, that looks appropriately arcane. And I want them to have collected some ingredients. Fur, feathers, scales. These are to represent the animal kingdom. Note the way it's not technical. I like the way that those feel like very broad categories and if we try to actually categorize every animal amongst them, it doesn't quite work that way, uh, but it has a very sort of old school alchemy kind of a feel to it where they were like, yes, of course, the, the fur, the feathers and the scales, that's all the animals, that's all the animal kingdoms. And of course, the blood of the caster drawn fresh during the ritual. Now, if I toss that aside just for a moment, there's a couple ways you can approach this, okay? Some examples would be, maybe you want your wizard to have to do this throughout like their first couple of levels. Maybe you just say, hey, you gotta get some fur, some feathers and some scales. And then throughout their early travels, you throw some animals in their way and they have to decide to collect those things. They have to remember to collect those things. That's how I did it the last time I was running this. I just gave them like a recipe. I gave them the ritual instructions and didn't like explain it at all in depth. I just said, here's the thing. You know that you have to get this stuff. And lo and behold, when they killed a crocodile, my magic user 
cuts off a little bit of them scales with her knife because she's like, I need some scales. How good is that? Maybe you run this as a little like a, a one-shotty thing, just you and the other person one-on-one -on -one before the whole game begins. Maybe they start in a wizard's tower, maybe they've been a wizard's apprentice and the wizard who has been teaching them actually has just a bunch of this stuff on hand and they choose the ingredients. Maybe choosing specific kinds of feathers will give the impression that it's influencing the ritual in some way. Just think about the flavor. The flavor's more important than the actuality. You know what I mean? Now, they set up the ritual. They have to have their summoning circle. Uh, I decided there are various points that they know they have to place the ingredients at. So the wizard's gonna be sitting at one end of this circle. You know, them with their blood of the caster, bleeding into a bowl or what have you. On the other end of this circle, they're going to have to place these three ingredients. You can add more ingredients if you want, if you have, like, ideas. For me, I place emphasis on uh, what gets placed in the center. If they decide to put scales in the center, if they decide to put fur in the center or feathers, in, you get the idea, right? They're, they're placing them in different, almost cardinal positions. They're not cardinal positions, but you know, you're presenting them with that idea of like, wait. And just take a little note of what they put, 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 put there. <laughs> I just completely forgot how to speak. Take notice of what they put where. All right, so that's step one done, right? They've prepped for the ritual. They have their ingredients, they put their ingredients in the place. Step two, personalized trials. Now this can sound intimidating, but ooh, stay with me. What we're gonna attempt to do here is make use of all the parts of the character sheet that we tend to gloss over, right? So where's, uh, where's the character sheet? Of course I have one lying around down here. Okay, so we tend to use this stuff a lot, right? We, we look a lot at the skills, we look uh, a lot at this stuff up here, and we look a lot at our weapons and attack stats. So what I wanna do is maybe bring some focus back to those other spaces. In order to give you an example of how these personalized trials might work, the wizard who is summoning the familiar will have to pass, oh, mysterious air quotes. We'll get back to that in a second. The wizard will have to pass a series of three trials in order to summon their animal familiar spirit. So what I've done uh, to give you an example of how this might work is I've rolled up just a just a quick start wizard from the handbook. So so what we have, uh, it's a half orc. I decided they were raised by humans. They're a wizard, obviously. Uh, their background is sage. I decided they were evocation uh, as their school specialty. Not that it really matters because everyone chooses evocation for their wizard, even though half the other schools are like a thousand times cooler. And I rolled on those tables that are in the background section and I found out uh, the personality trait, ideal bond and flaw. So this half orc wizard, I don't know, let's say their name is Nash. Nash's personality trait is, I'm willing to listen to every side of an argument before I make my own judgment. Nash's ideal is beauty. What is beautiful points us beyond itself towards what is true. What does that mean? Their bond, I work to preserve a library. And their flaw, I can't keep a secret to save my life or anyone else's. All right, so those are the sorts of things that we're looking at on this character sheet. So we're looking at class, race, background, alignment, ideals, bonds, flaws, all these things that are sprinkled around the edge of the character sheet that we kind of write down and then forget about. And what we the DM does, do's, do's? What we the DMs do, haha, I did it. We devise challenges for this specific character based on these elements. Looking at Nash the half orc wizard, I decided the most interesting things to play on were, since since I decided they were raised by humans, race would be an interesting thing to uh, to take a look at. This is all stolen a little bit from my cleric, who's a, who's a half orc. I also liked the, uh, the bond, that was the library that they preserve, and the flaws can't keep a secret to save myself or anyone else. So, trial the first. Maybe describe with some flowery language the way that the wizard, you know, muttering an incantation over and over again, dare forma physica a la mia anima. Dare forma physica a la mia anima. Right, and they start to, to fall into a trance and eventually they find that they have fallen deep within themselves and they are faced 
with a vision. So first I plucked that, uh, that concept of race, and maybe this racial tension of being raised by humans but being a half-orc. Nash the wizard is confronted with their human family members only speaking orcish. So in the example I pulled from one of my players, uh, Orvin is a half-orc cleric, he was raised by his, uh, his human family members, he doesn't speak orcish, and he has kind of a lot of guilt tied up in the idea of being part orc. So that's a great real world example, right? Your players will often have little tidbits like that. So pulling on that and the idea of these maybe racial tensions, ooh, I looked at uh, the race of Nash and I thought, okay, could be cool if there was a trial. Uh, Nash is faced with their human family members just milling about day-to-day -day life stuff, but they're all speaking orcish and Nash doesn't speak orcish. Let the player kind of interact with that scene for a little bit. Confusion, stress, all good emotions for them to be feeling. And then I would have Nash make an intelligence check in order to kind of overcome this disparity in communication. And here's the tricky key. It's gonna look to the player like they have to pass these tests, but it actually doesn't matter whether they pass or not. These are just glimpses into the personality they have chosen for their character. Nash is a wizard, high end, probably will pass this first test. But one way or the other, Say something that sounds real wise and mysterious. Maybe Nash realizes that they're the one who's been speaking orcish all along and actually their family is speaking common and Nash doesn't understand the human language after all. Ooh. So that's test one out of the way, tick. Example trial number two, that bond I, I worked to preserve a library. I just remembered Omar's gonna be editing this. Hey. Sup. After the shock of the first trial, uh, Nash blinks their eyes and finds themselves in that library that they protect. But it's on fire! Oh no! Nash knows that there are two priceless tomes on either side of the library and the flames are licking closer and closer and Nash has to choose between which book to save. Can Nash choose between two equally important books? The player makes a choice or tries to save both, does whatever they do. After they make this decision, boom, we're on to trial number three. Example trial number three, Nash blinks their eyes again, and suddenly, based on the floor, they're in a situation where they have to lie to save their own life. They have to literally keep a secret to save their own life. My voice is disappearing, why did that happen? Have the player make a deception check, whether they succeed or fail, they'll probably fail based on them having this floor. The trial is complete, and they find themselves back in the ritual circle looking as a, as a tear opens up between realities or whatever. And finally, they will meet their animal familiar. Step th step three, the form of the familiar spirit. If you have a player who really desperately wants a specific kind of animal, just give them the animal. They'll, they'll love you for it. I personally think that there is something to be said for not knowing what they'll get ahead of time. And just like I mentioned the last time I talked about this stuff, I like to sort of run a middle line between randomization and choice. What I'm going for is that excitement when you're playing a randomized version of a Pokemon game uh, and you find out for the first time what your three starter choices are, right? You're faced with three surprise Pokemon, you get the joy, the fun of not knowing, but then you get to pick your favorite one at the end of the day because it's important to like stuff. I do this based on the placement of the ingredients at the beginning when they're prepping the ritual. So I have a big long list of uh, all sorts of animals divided into animals in the scales category. Note that they are not actually all scaled. Things like scorpions are in here. Uh, fur and feathers. Some of these animals are very exotic. Some of these animals are surprisingly run of the mill. Some of these are just classic familiar spirit shapes. The kind of uh, universal theme of them is that they're like hip height or smaller. I think a familiar should in general be a smaller critter than like an animal companion for a ranger. So I cut all these up, I put them in different little hats, and then depending on what ingredient was placed front and center as the most important ingredient, I take the other two, so say they picked scales, they, they um, a fan of snakes or something. And so then you take the fur and the feathers categories, you mix them up together, and then either draw two from their favored category, one from the combined 
mix of the other two, or draw one from their favoured category that's like, it's a given that they definitely have one of the scales in there, and two from the other category. The choice is yours. I believe in you and your ability to make this decision. And then you present these three animal choices to the player. This is just between you and them. If you're doing this with the other players around, don't let them see nothing. The wizard player will make their choice and give you back the piece of paper to indicate this is the one, this is my animal familiar. And then you're free to make your flavor text. You know, describe the way uh, a, an honest little hedgehog rolls out from the tear between realities and comes to rest at, uh, at Nash's knees, heels. I don't know how Nash is sitting. <laughs> I should have thought about that ahead of time. Now, and this is very important because that's the end of step three, right? That's the form is done. It is very important to me, at least, that you either do this separately as a one-on-one -on -one thing with just this player, or if you want to keep the other players around, if you've got like a patient group who wants to like participate in this fun friend activity and be a part of this important stage in their wizard companion's life. Either way, make sure that this is where the session ends. And I mean, if, consider if you have the other players sitting around and your wizard character really knows what they desperately want as their familiar and you're gonna give it to them, keep it a surprise for the other players. Because that surprise will carry you through to the next session. Just go boom, this is it. The hedgehog rolls out and we close curtains on that moment. The, there's a fun element of like, oh, that's the decision done. That's the, we've, we've passed the trials and here we come to the conclusion of them. And there's an elation and you can end your session there. Because what you need to do for step four is you have to stat up that animal companion for the next session. I'm telling you this because the, do not stat up every single animal possible in your list. That's ridiculous. Don't do that. Wait till you know what the animal companion is and then stat it up. What are these stats you ask? Let me tell you. Remember, we are making use of every part of the character sheet in this, so here's what we're gonna do. There's the basic boring stuff that you need to know, so uh, the familiar spirit will use the wizard character's intelligence bonus. Their hit points, I would say, should be um, the, the maximum of one hit die of your wizard character, or just the animal's hit points, whichever is higher. But I think in general, uh, give them a wizard's hit die. That's d6, right? Other than that, it uses its normal animal stats. But then, ho ho, it gets exciting, because the animal is gonna give you a bonus to something you usually don't think so much about. This is like a tweak on the old Pathfinder system, right? In some ways, the bonus is gonna be like if you had a really cool magic item. That's what the familiar is doing. It's a permanent bonus increase to something. So I've written out some examples just to get your, your mind rolling. An armadillo familiar would perhaps give you a bonus to your armor class. A hyena familiar could give you an extra language proficiency. Ooh, that's based on an old school, it's like a folkloric, mythological thing. The hyena could learn human speech, could mimic people, could lure you, it's a thing. A wombat familiar, maybe you get an extra hit die. Think about that too. Like if your wizard has an extra hit die, they're gonna wanna take short rests more and that's gonna influence the whole group to start taking short rests. Probably not in a massive way, but it could be a fun thing. A kingfisher familiar, add five feet to your total speed. A rooster familiar, bonus to initiative. Cobra could be like a bonus to your attack. Uh, a peacock, imagine this, you get a bonus first level spell slot. Just an extra first level spell slot. Forever. A bat could give you blindsight. There are so many possibilities. Once you know what animal they are going to have as their familiar, you can take it aside between sessions and compare to their character sheet and think, what's a cool little reflection of if this is like an empowered piece of that wizard character themselves, if this is like their spirit as a creature in physical form, then what's a cool symbolic representation of that? And give them a dope bonus from it. And for me, I think it's important that uh, their familiar can attack if they wanted to. On the whole, apart from that, I think the familiar should work a lot like the find familiar spell, except for a couple of key differences. I don't think that you should be able to uh, banish and resummon your familiar. I think if your familiar dies, your familiar dies. For me, I think that if your familiar dies, uh, you should actually have a little bit of a permanent loss 
in hit points. Nothing huge, but just enough to be able to say to that player, that character, that they physically feel the hurt, the pain of their animal familiar spirit when they die. Your goal here is kind of to make your player cry a little bit. Break their heart just, just in a little teensy, teensy little chip. Maybe they won't, but that's the goal. You know, shoot for the moon, land among the stars and all that. I don't think you should be able to send your familiar into a pocket dimension. I think it should stay with you all the time. If your player does end up with something like a tortoise where that's gonna get like real problematic or even just a creature that will not be welcome in like civilized spaces, then I recommend uh, letting them sort of suffer through that for a little while, for a couple of sessions or whatever, and then have them find a, an old school spell that lets them turn a familiar into a tattoo or something. I think it's key that it's not something that sends it to another plane. I like the idea of it like turning into an animal tattoo because then it's like a visual reminder, gives your player something cool to imagine, something cool to describe about their character, they're into art, something cool to draw about their character, but it also, it keeps their familiar with them at all times. That's a key thing. We want to make them cry, remember? Quick side note, warlocks. Interesting you should ask. It's worth thinking about. You can just run a warlock familiar exactly the same way if you want to. I think it's worth thinking about what the difference between a warlock and a wizard is. For me, the way I imagine wizards, I imagine them as being like paragons of study. They have mastered magic through study, through hard work, through years and years of apprenticeship or whatever. And to me, a warlock in contrast is someone who took the easy way out, they took the shortcut. Instead of doing all the study, they took on a super powerful patron who could give them that that magic and that, that control, that power, much more quickly. And as part of that, I think for me, rather than having warlocks, you know, summon a little bit of their spirit and what have you, I think that their patron would just give them a familiar that symbolizes the patron more than the warlock. So I don't know, maybe maybe they would go about the beginnings of the process of summoning an animal familiar, set up the ritual and whatever, but then halfway through the trials, their patron just comes in and is like, nah, screw that, here you got a, I don't know, pseudo dragon. Worth thinking about. So that's my familiars system. Hope that you you at least had some some thoughts bouncing off from that. I think it's fun, I think it's a neat little thing to kind of balance um, player wants and like little flavors, little spices of like surprise and unexpected whatevers. Apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done, email this to your grandma, I'll see you some other time. Didn't throw that very well.